Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Life Vision Project. I'm Dr. Jason Deitch. I have the pleasure, of course, of being here with President of Life University, my great friend, Dr. Guy Reekman. Guy, welcome, and thanks for spending some time with us today. Happy to be back. So uh, you wrote this extraordinary book about living an extraordinary life. Uh, you speak to thousands of chiropractors around the world, students, uh, faculty, um, in the profession, out of the profession. Uh, it's safe to say that you get asked on a pretty regular basis about living an extraordinary life. And so today, um, I'd like to get some of those answers. What do you tell people that are looking to understand what's the process of being successful? What's the process of identifying my life vision and living a life vision? Sure. Buy the book. <laughs> Thank you, and have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, in the book, I think it's probably a good format for the conversation. Uh, in the book, I talk about five values, uh, five people who have lived those values, uh, because it's always great to model and see it in other people. And then five things you can do immediately um, to begin to, to live or express uh, an extraordinary life. Um, so we'll see how we go. We flow through this. It's been a while uh, since I actually read that book. But, uh, <laughs> I talk about five people in it. Uh, for example, uh, some of them well-known, like Nelson Mandela, right? Um, but some people perhaps less well-known. Uh, Lech Walesa, of course, we know if you grew up in the 80s, uh, watched the Berlin Wall come down, you know that he was uh, the person in Gdansk, Poland, uh, that was a shipyard worker that jumped over a fence uh, with a group of his friends because they'd been locked out of work by the Communist Party, and they embarrassed the Communist Party by jumping over the fence and going to work anyway, and uh, in and out of prison for years, and finally, in a bloodless revolution, uh, was named the president of his country and stood on the steps of the communist headquarters and said, and it's an epigram that's up at the school, it says uh, um, uh, that someday uh, our children and our children's children may be able to sing a more positive song, but until that time we have work to do. And so there was this, you know, this shipyard worker, just blue collar guy, uh, standing in front of the world, giving out this elegant sort of quote about our commitment and responsibility of the world. Uh, and then there were people. My favorite of all of them was Václav Havel, uh, who was an educator. Uh, he was in college in uh, Czechoslovakia in the 1960s, in the Spring Revolution, where uh, students were uh, throughout the uh, Soviet Union uprising are having uprisings for freedom of speech, and he was one of those crazy college students uh, standing up for that. And uh, Czechoslovakia at the time uh, would not suppress them, and so the Russians, without permission from Czechoslovakia, rolled the tanks into Prague and uh, suppressed it. It was called the Spring Revolution. Um, and in and out of jail for 40 years, he, he was a playwright, he was an academic, and again in a, what they called the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, was named president of his country, came to the United States. He became the spokespiece person for Eastern Europe and the rebuilding of Eastern Europe. Um, and so he came to the United States, and everybody knew he was coming to ask for money to rebuild Eastern Europe. So all the uh, democratic countries had gotten together and committed money, and they were basically supposed to hand him a check. Uh, and he was uh, uh, permitted to do an address at a joint session of Congress which is usually only reserved for the president once a year uh, for the State of the Union. And uh, Václav Havel got up, and instead of asking for money, he lectured the U.S. government on responsibility uh, in the world, uh, knowing that the check and the money would run out if he didn't have people that were partners in this process. Um, you know, you just think of the, the guts, the huevos it must have taken for a guy, a school teacher, to come to the United States and lecture the U.S. government on responsibility. Um, and he did it with elegance, of course. He, he was great. Um, and then you have people that you've probably never heard of. Um, uh, Candy Leitner, uh, whose um, daughter was killed by a drunk driver. It was his fourth conviction as a drunk driver. And uh, she created an organization called MAD, uh, to make it short, and literally changed the drunk driving laws in this country. Uh, and I saw recently a statistic uh, that prior to, to Matt and what she was doing, uh, 
Uh, and then the statistics on children that were killed by drunk drivers after what she did, what she did for decades. And it was about 10,000 children a year difference. So there, you could easily say that uh, because of her work, there are 10,000 children this year at home having dinner with their parents tonight that wouldn't have had she not made that commitment. Um, and then Jody Williams, who uh, saw a special on a housewife in New, Z in New England. We've been in the Peace Corps, things like that in the 60s, but saw a special on um, landmines and how they, after the wars are done, nobody goes back and digs up the landmines. And for a decade or more afterwards, somebody would be walking through a field, a child on the way to school, and step on one of these things, lose a, a, a life, an arm, a leg. And she made a commitment to put them out of business and uh, wound up getting a Nobel Prize. And uh, is every country in the world that the U.N. stood up and signed a document that they would no longer use landmines in these wars? So I think the beautiful part of all of that, which I'm going to make a comment on, I think they had certain values in common, five things in common. But what's always amazing to me is even though they got some notoriety in various levels at the end, in, in the beginning, they were really just a lawyer in South Africa, a blue-collar shipyard worker in Gdansk, Poland, a housewife in New England, a, a mother, um, uh, and a school teacher, you know, in, in, in a communist world. And yet, because they did what they, they held on to what they believed and didn't give up their soul, they altered the lives of millions of people. Um, and so I look at those people and I go, what do they have in common? And I think there's five things. I know this is sounding more like a, a monologue than a – so interrupt if you choose. But the five things I found were, number one, they had a vision. They were really clear on who they were, what they were up to, and they were authentic. And they were willing to take whatever consequences came with that vision. So they were willing to go to jail for their entire lifetime in South Africa to stand up what they believed in. Right? They were willing um, you know, to, to get on a plane in the middle of the night and fly to Seattle, Washington – to lobby a few people at the state legislature to alter uh, a drunk driving bill that was coming up uh, and leave their family behind in order to go do that. I mean, once they had their vision, it was full out, right? There was no, there was no ups and downs. They were fully committed to this. Uh, the second thing is that they were committed, right? Um, they weren't tampering. They weren't trying out the idea. They weren't seeing how people responded. Uh, they certainly were interested in feedback. I'm not saying they were immune to it. But it didn't alter them from their vision of what they were committed, committed to. Uh, the third thing is, uh, every one of these people that starts on a path like this accepts, to a large degree, based on faith, that things can change. There's no guarantees. Uh, you can't define all the outcomes. In fact, when you start down the journey, you don't know what the outcome. It wasn't like Mandela you know, blew up the post office, went to jail. Um, knowing they were going to sentence him to life in prison, and then figure he'd get out 29 years later and become president of the country. You, you follow me? That, just, that wasn't the plan, right? right? And he didn't wake up and go, I'm going to be president one day. Right, and here's the best way for me to do that, right, right? is to get arrested. Right. Um, so, they, And I'll talk about that. They took advantage of the options, but they had faith, and I think they had faith in two things. One is they had faith in the capacity of the human spirit. Uh, for vision and forgiveness and compassion and those kinds of issues. And they had faith that uh, as long as they were willing to work hard, that they could produce an outcome, that people would rally around them. Uh, I saw, I know there's a video out on um, uh, TED Talks. It's a short video on leadership. And one of the comments in it is, uh, a leader without any followers is just a nut, Right. And so they had faith that people were going to come along with them and participate because this vision, their vision had value. Uh, and then the, the fourth thing is uh, they had a commitment to excellence. And I think there's a big misnomer as to what excellence is. Uh, people think that if you do three things, you'll have excellence. Uh, or they think that excellence has to do with perfection. And neither of those two things are true. Uh, if you look up in the dictionary, uh, it says that excellence is a state of being. It's a state of being, which makes it then similar to something like love, for example. Um, you can't do four things and be in love. Love is a state of being. Um, and people often ask, well, how do you get into that state of being? And the answer is 
Um, you enter the state of being when you say so. You enter the state of being when you commit to it. So how do you get into a state of being called excellence? You get into it when you say, I'm going to live my life with excellence and nothing else is acceptable. Um, and that's not about perfection, right? That's a commitment to live a certain way. Um, that's just, uh, excellence is about uh, surrounding yourself that, with people that call you to something bigger. Uh, excellence is about having a vision big enough to commit your life spirit to it. Uh, excellence is about um, discipline and work. Uh, one of the things I teach at the school is a course on integrity called Rights and Responsibilities. And the last hour of the seminar, the eight-hour seminar, is on excellence. And we look at people like Tiger Woods before the thing fell apart. We look at Wayne Gretzky. But we also look at business leaders, great parents, et cetera. And I've noticed over the years, decades, in looking at these people, there are seven things about them. One of them is they're deeply disciplined. Uh, they don't just wake up and sort of, you know, Tiger was out when he was in his prime, practicing 14 hours a day. He was already the best golfer in the world. He still practiced 14 hours a day. Uh, Michael Jordan, when the team finished at the end of the day, shot a thousand free throws. The last hundred with his eyes closed. You know how many hours it takes to shoot a thousand free throws. Um, and yet he was already the best in the world. So these people have discipline, they have ways of staying in integrity. Uh, they surround themselves with people, they call them to something bigger. And when you start living your life that way, you've entered the state of being called excellence. Uh, and if you look at those five people I talked about, all of them had that. All of them had that. And then finally, the last value is integrity, uh, which simply, by definition, is a state of completeness and wholeness. And so what integrity simply says, it's not about morality or ethics per se. Uh, integrity is about having a commitment and then honoring your commitment for no other reason than you gave your word to it. Um, and so, you know, if you look at those five people and then apply these five values, I think you see that as a common thread running through all of them, even though some of them were politicians, some of them were fighting for drunk driving rights, some of them were working to get rid of landmines. Uh, and if you look at great chiropractors and great parents, I think you'll see all of these things going on with them. Yeah. Do you think, you know, you, you mentioned these people and they feel like they're the exception, they're standouts, they're, you know, like uh, I think of Dances with Wolves and how, you know, it was a circumstantial situation and all of a sudden you became you know, the hero. Is this something yeah. only for the few, or how do we collectively, each individually identify with what it is you're talking about? So it's not just the one or two heroes that happen to make history yeah. for the moment. But and it, and it, that was my point at the beginning, except for Mandela, who's well known. Um, these people were shipyard workers. You follow me? They're housewives. They're, uh, I look at my dad in 1947, fighting for chiropractic rights in New Mexico with four of the chiropractors and um, two of them, their offices were firebombed. The others, they came in and put gasoline and destroyed all their records, right? Uh, he'll never be in a textbook anywhere. They'll never have a seminar on him. He's not going to be on 3030 on ESPN. You follow me? And yet uh, he fit right into that category, right? Wow. He had these five values. Uh, he was doing his work. He wasn't looking to get recognized. And I don't think any of those five people were looking to get recognized. They had, their recognition wasn't what they got on a stage or an award that someone gave them, their recognition was the pride that they got, the value that they got, uh, the joy that they got by seeing their dreams becoming a reality. I, I love what you're saying, and, and just applying it back to the profession specifically, um, it sort of reminds me of, of you know, those chiropractors that go, I don't need to market, or I don't need to invest time in getting the message out to more people, I have enough new patients. Right, and that's you irrelevant. Go, <laughs> you go, what? What? Um, so I think it's exactly the spirit uh, that I hope more and more in our profession certainly is the intention of the Life Vision Project of us coming together uh, is to, you know, better understand the anatomy of, of, an, of creating, understanding, identifying what your life vision is, understanding, the, you know, the rules, the principles, the expectations, uh, and know, you know, if you're working hard, uh, if you're doing things and, and you know, may not have hit the lottery yet, uh, you know, but if you're following your core and listening to that voice inside, you're probably right on track. Would you agree? Yeah. And, I, you know, if I were to take those five values that I talked about, uh, I think at life we would probably call those lasting purpose. Yeah. 
to give, serve, love, and do, right? To give for the sake of giving, serve for the sake of serving, uh, love for the sake of loving, and to do with excellence for the sake of doing, yeah. right? With excellence. Um, and, and to do that from a sense of gratitude and the abundance that we have as human beings, especially people that live in this country with a chiropractic degree and the opportunity to have the kinds of income and lifestyle that we have. Um, and, I, you know, I think if you're doing that with lasting purpose, uh, Bill Harris used to tell me all the time, uh, the hole you receive through is the hole you give through. And the bigger the hole, I mean, I know it's corny, but the bigger the hole, uh, the more the universe can provide. And uh, one of the things I talk about with students in this integrity class is that there's an unlimited amount of love in the universe. I remember when my first child was born, uh, I couldn't have imagined loving anything more. And I think every parent may have experienced this. If they have a second one on the way, there's something before they're even born where you go, how can I ever love this one as much as I love the first one? And You know, we look at the world and, and love, for example, as a pie that's finite that you cut up and split up among friends and family and children. Uh, and I can just tell you that when the second one was born, I loved her at 100%, and it didn't take anything away from the first one. I still love that one because there's an unlimited amount. You can't outgive the universe, right? You just can't outgive the universe. Uh, it may not always give it back to you the way you want it. You know, sometimes you want it back in money, and sometimes you want it back in, you know, a bigger practice faster. But sometimes it comes back uh, in the form of a child whose life has changed because of what you're doing. The, you know, the Dalai Lama's gotten, we've gotten very close with him in life because of our programs and some of the prison, the prison project that we're doing, which is uh, literally going to transform, empty the jails. Uh, that we're doing with the governor's office here in Georgia, the Department of Corrections. And so the Dalai Lama is coming to campus. And I was looking through a thing he had recently about 21 things you should do and look at in how you live your life. And one of them is uh, to live your life with integrity so that when you get to the end, you get to enjoy it twice, one while you're doing it and when you look back on it. Uh-huh. And my guess is that when we get to the end of our lives, we probably won't remember any particular day and what the deposit was that day at the bank. But we're going to look back and remember the people that were impacted by what we do. So, um, as my good friend Fred, Fred Barnes would say, maybe enough said. Yeah. Thank you for watching, Guy. Thank you for sharing, uh, for sharing your heart, your passion, your life vision for so many decades with so many people. Um, and, and for making the impact that you do, uh, because it does matter and it does make a difference. And I hope everybody watching really feels that and gets that and embraces that for their own lives so that collectively uh, we can reach what I think we sort of refer to as the chiropractic mountaintop. So, uh, I think for like extraordinary. That's exactly right. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Guy Reekman and myself, thank you for watching another edition of the Life Vision Project.